Good afternoon and welcome to the winter 2024 Lineman Associates Capital Markets Webinar presented by Lineman Associates and Real Estate Financial Modeling. This is your host, Bruce Kirsch, founder and CEO of REFM, provider of financial analysis tools and training to the business since 2009. We're pleased to have an insightful program again for you today, which will be presented by Dr. Peter Lineman, founder of Lineman Associates which for those of you who do not know, is a strategic and investment analysis advisory firm. We are using the Zoom platform and I'm gonna address just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started, just to make sure everyone is oriented. On the audio front, all the participant audio is muted, meaning we cannot hear you as a participant and that's by design and will remain the case throughout the session. If you're attending by computer, take a moment to familiarize or reacquaint yourself with the control panel. We will be showing the slides, but if you would like to download them, we are going to upload them to the chat now. And you don't need to have the slides up because we'll be showing them, but they're certainly available to you uh, for future reference. And the slides are now uploaded. Let's make sure that that's going to everyone. Let's try that one more time. Okay. And as usual, we've reserved 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer participant questions. Feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation by clicking the Q&A button and just make sure that you hit enter after you type your question in. If at any point during the webinar you get disconnected, just reconnect the uh, same way you did initially. And if you are registered later today, you will automatically receive an email with the link to the recording of the webinar. And also later today, the video of the webinar will be posted on the Lineman Associates website. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the presenter, Dr. Peter Lineman, CEO of Lineman Associates. And Peter, what is that famous saying, whether it's uh, a curse or something that's positive, may you live in interesting times. Yeah, may you live in interesting times. The question is, is it a blessing or a curse, right? right. Well, these are certainly interesting times, Bruce. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, let's go to the first slide, which is real GDP. I'll remind people that when um, I say real, I simply mean adjusted for uh, official inflation. You're gonna hear why I say official um, as we go through this. First slide shows real GDP. The top straight line is what would it have been if we'd have just continued the pre-pandemic trend, which by the way, was not a terribly aggressive trend because the 2010s were a relatively low growth decade. So if we'd have just continued the uh, 2010s growth rate, that's what we would have done. The red simply marks where we started to help your eye. And then the darker blue is where we're really at. So you can see that we've got real GDP above where we were four years ago. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is we're still about 2% below potential. Um, we have lots of pent up demand in the economy still. Um, if people ask me where, and you say autos, you can look at autos. At first, we, we didn't, were afraid to go out and buy them. Then when we tried to buy them, they weren't available. Then just about as they became available, a lot of people couldn't do it because of interest rates. Just for an example, healthcare. Healthcare has tremendous pent up demand still. Hips that were put off, getting replaced, uh, um, cataracts, et cetera, et cetera. They're still catching up. Um, and, and travel and tourism. Travel and tourism um, last year was the same as four years earlier. Well, you've had growth. So you would have expected travel and tourism to be well above four years ago. And there's tremendous pent up. Another way of saying it is in the last four years, remember four years ago was just prior to the pandemic shutdown. In the last four years, we've grown three years and two months. That means moving forward, 
we have a normal year's growth. Think about 2024, a normal year growth. Plus, we're going to make up some of the 10 months that are pent up. I don't think we'll make it all up this year, but we're going to make up some of it. And if you go a year ago, I was one of the few people who said, no, of course, we're not going to have a recession. It was largely based off this chart. By the way, the gap then was about four and a half percent uh, pent up. And so and if you go back two years ago, it was enormous. So we're working our way through pent up and um, that's driving the economy. Um, if you go to the next chart, um, it's employment. And again, this is another one, the same way to view it. It's the pre-pandemic trend, the line to show you where we started as the shutdown occurred, what actually happened. And again, with a lag uh, relative to GDP, employment is above where it was. We have more people working today than we did before, but we're still about 3 million short out of about 160 million jobs. Um, labor markets have gotten much better, uh, much uh, not nearly so good for the employee as it was when that gap was big. Uh, but as that gap is narrowed, labor markets are coming back into much better balance, but still we have uh, people not back to work and it's basically all people over 62 years old. Some of them died, some of them uh, decided, no, I'm not coming back. Some of them retired a year or two earlier, some retired a year or two earlier after they got fired, some have long COVID. All the other age groups are back. I'll come to that in one slide. Go to the next. This is industries adding employees and you can see it normalized. Uh, it shot way up, and that was because the entire economy, not the entire, probably two, uh, a good third of the economy shut down. And when we opened back up, that all of those sectors caught up. We're back down to something like normal, um, which is above 50% of the economy is adding jobs, but some sectors are growing, some sectors are shrinking. That's the normal course of events. It's around normal to maybe very slightly below normal. Go to the next is what I was talking about, about the over 65s. Um, I talked about it over 62. The data is a little more obvious on the 65 year olds. I have the marker on where it was pre-pandemic. The flat line is the pre-pandemic. You can see there was this very robust trend upward for 30 years or more. It even during the uh, financial crisis powered right through that, dropped like an anchor as we got into the shutdown and the pandemic, rebounded a bit, but is still not back to where it was. Now I expect this to come up. Why? Not so much because a 71 year old is gonna come back to the labor force, but the 71 year old was gonna retire anyway, and they're being replaced by somebody who is now 62 and in a couple of years is gonna be 65. So it's gonna come up as that goes back to normal. This is the missing labor force. All the other age categories are back. Um, go to the next slide it was what I was saying about where is pent up demand. It's in a lot of places, but big sectors where it is, is medical care, travel and tourism, auto and housing. Go to how the economy has continued to grow even as the Fed raised interest rates. And for me, this wasn't hard. I said this a year or so ago and, and I knew it, which was most of this economy is not sensitive to short-term interest rates. Many households don't borrow. Many businesses don't borrow at all. Forget short or long term. 42% uh, of the households are locked in long term mortgages at very cheap rates. Um, uh, lots of real estate owners locked in long term mortgages at low rates. So, sectors of the economy, right off the top, that are not interest rate sensitive government. Government is not going to reduce their employment or their outlays. 
depending on the interest rate being a bit higher, short-term interest rates. Same for medical care. I somewhat jokingly say that if I were to have a heart attack right now, or I'm not going to say to the people who come in, no, no, don't take me across the street to Jefferson Hospital until Powell cuts the interest rates. Nobody is saying, no, no, I'm not going to deliver my baby until Powell lowers the interest rate to 4%. And then you have items like food and many others, and you end up with about 80% of the economy is not interest rate sensitive. Now, of course, that means 20% is, go to the next chart, and entrepreneurial property development. I only designate entrepreneurial, not government, not hospitals, not institutional, but entrepreneurial. And that's because they use short-term money. Uh, they use floating rate debt. The run-up in interest rates has been crushing on, um, on development in that regard. Autos. About two thirds of all the people who buy autos buy it on floating or short term debt. Some, but not all, credit card purchases. People forget that the main reason the amount of credit card debt has gone up over time is not that people are borrowing more. It is rather that we increasingly use it for convenience payment. And probably more than half of all credit card debt is not true debt in the sense that it's paid off during the grace period with no interest charged against it. Um, and that gets more and more every day, every year, as people increasingly use credit cards rather than checks or cash. Um, businesses that have lines of credit secured by inventory and receivables, and that's a fair number of manufacturing firms, for example, not just, also some retail firms, um, they use floating rate debt and they are affected. So in the end, it's about 20% of the economy that to some degree is interest rate sensitive. Go to the, but the, the way to view this is we have normal growth, and we're below trend. This whole notion of soft landing is absurd. The notion of soft landing is the economy is above trend and coming down to trend. And the question is, will it nicely touch that trend line or will it crash through and go negative relative to the trend line? We're below the trend line. And so we're, what's the meaning of a soft landing from below? We want to go beyond, we have to get to trend before we have to worry about getting above trend and coming down. This is kind of absurd discussion of soft landing. The Fed is slowing 20% of the economy with interest rates, 80% is just powering right through, uh, unaffected, untouched. And the fact that there's so much pent up means it doesn't have any impact. Um, housing starts in auto are... Uh, normalized to be indexes here to 100 so I can put them on the same scale. You can see that they were pretty much high, uh, synchronized with one another until about 2009. And then housing fell off a cliff, a big gap developed between the two. Auto continued a normal pattern. Housing took on an abnormal pattern. It really wasn't until 2021 that they synchronized again. Um, there's a huge shortfall of housing associated with that period where they didn't synchronize from 2009 to 2021. We'll come back to that. They are synchronized again. They are both being hurt uh, by the Fed, particularly auto, more than uh, housing, but they both are being hurt. Um, go to the next um, brick retail sales in real terms. Um, you can see the red line just shows you where we were uh, four years ago, right before the shutdown. You see the drop that occurred with the shutdown, and we're back at you know, new highs. What we've got are retail sales that are growing. They're growing slightly less than inflation. The new numbers came out. They were less than inflation. Um, 
uh, but people have jobs, they have wealth, um, they have lots of job opportunities and are basically spending, but we're no longer at a real peak. We're down a bit, but still solid. Meanwhile, next chart is real e-commerce as a percent of total retail sales. And you can see it shot up dramatically when retail was shut brick retail was shut and then kind of has flatlined and begun just recently starting heading back up. And you're kind of going back to trend. It still is only about one out of every $6 sold, not counting autos. Um, it's only about one out of every $6, but it's an important sector and it's a growing sector. It will continue to grow, probably bottomed out and moving up, although I think it's going to move up at a slower rate because the lowest hanging retail fruit has already gone online and the harder and harder retail online stills to come. Go to the next, oil. Um, oil is down 33% from April, 2022, April, 2022, lots of analysts, all you had to do was pick up the Wall Street, et cetera, Bloomberg, and they said it was going to get to 150 to 200. I said, no way, extraction prices are profitable from fracking and the tar sands at 40 to $50 a barrel. And yep, it's gonna be volatile, but it's gonna come down. It's bouncing around in inflation adjusted terms, but bouncing around its average, which is about $80 a barrel. I don't know what it is this morning, but yesterday it basically was $80 a barrel. And that's basically the historic average over a long period of time, basically over the last 50 years, but it does tend to be volatile. The U.S. is the largest producer of oil in history. We produce more oil in the uh, fourth quarter and in January than any country has ever produced in history. Um, we are energy neutral. It gets harder and harder for OPEC to control oil for any sustained period of time, mainly because we are a major producer. Canada is also a big producer. And more recently, uh, Guyana has become uh, a very aggressive and desirous producer. Poor country, lots of reserves, see that as a way to enrich the country. So it just gets harder and harder for OPEC to control it in the way they might have controlled it many years ago for any sustained period of time. Go to the next. Uh, this is the Fed's um, global supply chain index. If it's above the line, it, if, if it's above the red line, it means uh, systematic shortages of stuff. If it's below the line, systematic excesses of stuff. What you can see is generally it's pretty close to the line, plus or minus one standard deviation, which is to say normal kind of stuff. Some markets are in excess supply, some in excess demand, not a big deal. And by the way, this is the world that when Milton Friedman said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena, it was a world where this chart was flat, jiggly, but flat. And he, his comment was because it's impossible to envision a world where essentially for all products, there would be shortages. And, and there'd be shortages for some, but they'd be offset by surpluses of others. And to get inflation to happen, you would either have to have shortages all across the economy or too much money. Well, you see what happened to this index. This index went from kind of nothing in terms of abnormal to four and a quarter standard deviations of tightness in supply. And for those of you who don't remember or know what four, four and a quarter standard deviations means, it means we've never seen anything like it. When you have supply tightness like you've never seen before, you saw prices go up very rapidly because across the economy, we shut down the economy, 
supply and demand both kind of rolled back. Demand came back faster for almost everything. Prices then went up because demand was greater than supply. Prices go up, Econ 101. Um, you average those and it looked like inflation. That created lots of profit and that profit brought about an expansion of the supply. And you can see that at the current moment, that blue line is right back to essentially no net excess supply, excess demand. It went up to four and a quarter standard deviations. It then went down to a short period of excess supply. And now it's back to about balanced. This was a very fast movement up in inflation we saw. Well, you wouldn't expect to see fast movement up in inflation if it was monetary. It would be slow and rolling through the economy. We saw a very, very rapid movement up, and we've now seen a very rapid movement down. So let's go to inflation, go to the next chart. And this is annualized monthly inflation. So take the month over month inflation rate, and then, um, annualize it, all right? And so the blue line, and I'm gonna go into this in more detail in a second, the light blue line is what you're gonna see in the coming months, because what is shown as annualized inflation really isn't inflation that's occurring right now. So go to the next chart, and I've never, I've talked this through with people. At the end of this, chart, you'll know something that almost no one in the economy knows, and yet is all you have to do is go to the data, get a calculator, and do it. So uh, Tuesday, the annual, the uh, CPI inflation number came out. So I went back and looked, and I calculated the inflation of CPI, as they reported, between August 23 and January 24, the data that came out Tuesday, and then annualized it. So I took the change over those months and just converted it into an annualized number. And that was 1.1%. So since August, we have had 1.1% annualized rate of inflation. Not what they said, the 3.6 and the year over year and all that. That's what's really happened since August, 1.1%. It's important to understand that the second bullet point is housing, which is basically 40% of that index, was 5.9%. Now, why was housing 5.9%? Housing's 5.9% because they have 138,000 items that they get the price of in January relative to December. And there's one item that they look back eight months ago and say, how much higher is the price than nine months ago? And that's housing. And housing was, uh, and this is, think of rent. Housing was 5.9%. Now, any of you who are in the apartment business know that in, in eight months ago, you might have been getting annualized rental increases of 5 to 6%. But since August, you've been not getting much of anything, plus 2%, minus 2%, kind of zero. And certainly recently, you're getting zero. If you put in zero, as the contemporaneous rate of inflation of housing. You get that in fact, from August CPI inflation, if housing was in fact zero, which is very close to what it really was, you get an inflation rate annualized of minus 1%. That is very slightly deflationary over the period since August. Um, it, it, why people don't know this is stunning. 
think of it differently. They have 138,000 items that on average show no inflation. They have one item that shows huge inflation, but gee, that's from eight months ago. Well, if you took all 138,000 items and did them from eight months ago, the inflation would be much higher because eight months ago, you still had supply chain issues working their way through the system. So based on CPI, which came out Tuesday, if you set housing at zero, which is my best estimate, what it was over that period, or around zero, you get minus. That means even if you have a modestly, like a 1% positive rate of housing increase over that period, it's zero inflation. Now I did the same thing with the personal consumption expenditure index, which came out two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago. And the main difference between the two is personal consumption expenditure only has a 20% weight attributed to housing, whereas CPI has about a 40%. And all you're doing is allocating, not all, mostly what you're doing is allocating that extra 20% weight across other items. So I did the exercise on the fourth quarter. I simply took the personal consumption expenditure from the beginning of the fourth quarter to the end of the fourth quarter. The January data is not out yet. From the beginning of the fourth quarter to the end of the fourth quarter and annualized it. And what you have annualized over the fourth quarter based on the personal consumption expenditure was 0.4 inflation annual. If you look at what they had for housing over the period, it was 5.8%, basically the same as what was in for uh, um, the CPI. Little different period. This is only the fourth quarter rather than back to August. So it's slightly different period. That's what it amounts to the difference. And um, again, if instead of putting in 5.8%, which reflects eight months earlier in the data, you put in zero, you get zero, you could you get minus 0.7% inflation. That is absolutely consistent with the minus 1% from CPI. They both show that by and large, the 138,000 prices in the economy, probably about half are going up a bit, a few a lot, about half are going down, a few of them a lot, more or less those that are going up, canceling out those that go down. And housing is just like every other product in the 138,000. That is to say, there was a shortage that drove rents up, that made profitability on apartments look really great, that brought forth new supply, that new supply is coming online in the last few months and over the coming months. And that has swung from uh, big increases to nothing. Now, one other thing is, it's important to understand that deflation means prices are falling. But as I point out here, it's like a percent. It's modest. Uh, most of us can't tell a 1% difference in our prices. Um, we tend to focus on the prices that go up. That's negativity bias, which is well documented. We ignore the prices that are going down. We feel it's like when your team fumbles the ball and you lose it, that's bad luck. But when you recover the other team's fumble, that's deserved and skill. Um, and so what we've got is a situation where prices on average aren't changing much. Understand that when supply and demand, when demand is higher than supply, prices go up. When supply is greater than demand, prices go down. When they're balanced, they stay about the same. That's sort of where we're at. And um, you're going to see inflation numbers officially come in very low because this lag is going to pick up things going down. You can already calculate how much inflation will be in next month uh, by going back and looking uh, seven months ago 
at the change in housing. That's already in the books. And all you're waiting for is to hear for, about the other items. But it's not telling you about inflation now. That chart I just showed you tells you about inflation, quote, now, which is the relevant thing from a policy point of view. And it's crazy the Fed and, and the media and, and observers and most economists just don't do the math. Go to the next, you see the 10 year treasury and the Fed funds rate. We have an inflation rate in the last quarter, in the last month, that truly is slightly negative, and yet we have a five and a quarter to five and a half short term rate. That's an absurdly high real rate. That's even more absurd than having the rate at zero when inflation was one and a half percent, which we did for most of the 2010s. That was absurd in the opposite direction. This is like three and a half times, four times as absurd as it was then. This is bad policy. It's highly distortionary. It means wh why do anything if I can get a real return, real, real return of around 6%. And so people are sitting on their hands collecting 6% doing nothing. Now they're not gonna do it forever. The Fed will eventually wake up. They're always late. They're always way late. They say they're not gonna react very fast. Remember, they told you they weren't gonna raise rates and two months later began the fastest rate increase we've ever had. So don't be so sure. Um, I think they're gonna be very slow and then not so slow because of what we just went through in the previous chart. Go to the next chart uh, table. Don't be, interest rates are very important from finance point of view. They're less important from a cap rates point of view. We've talked about in the past in my research and no one has shown any data to contradict it. Cap rates are primarily driven by capital flows. Um, capital flows dry up for whatever reason, cap rates go up. Now this time cap rates went up because the flow dried up because interest rates went up. But that was not what happened in 2009, 2010. Cap rates went up because money stopped flowing, but interest rates were low. It was not about the interest rates. It was about, for whatever reason, if money doesn't flow. And if for whatever reason money does flow, cap rates go down. Right now, you have lots of dry powder on the sideline. You have major banks with excess reserves. Um, you have them trying to charge too high a risk premium because they're not picking up any return from the slope of the yield curve. So return that they would normally pick up from the slope of the yield curve, they're trying to get through credit spreads. And people are saying, well, that's an absurdly high credit spread. Remember, capital markets normalize, or another way is eventually greed returns, fear subsides. There's a lot of money on the sideline. Expect greed to return. Do I know exactly when? Well, I know the short rate should be no higher than 3%. Bear in mind, if the short rate was at 3%, that's a three and a half to 4% real rate given where inflation is at for real right now. You could argue that the interest rate should be as low as 2% given we have deflation. If you don't believe me, go back and look at what they talked about when they thought we were deflationary and put rates very low. Um, Long rate should probably be at a three and a half to 4%. Um, why, as inflation normalizes out to one and a half to 2%, you should have the long rate at the three and a half to 4%. And you should generally then have the cash flow cap rate, cash flow, not NOI, cash flow cap rate for a good quality property should be in the 3.5% range with 
that being the cash flow, unlevered cash flow yield, and then you get inflation plus a bit uh, on top of that as part of the unlevered return. And I don't go through the mathematics here, but we do in Lineman Letter go through the mathematics. We actually give a model uh, in the last issue, a little template you can click on. It's a simple template. You can play with it. I encourage you to do it. We're not holding it out as the gospel, but rather a, a template framework to think. Go to the next housing. Uh, multifamily starts. This is since 2002. So basically over the last 22, 21 years, um, if it's above the line, we have a surplus of multifamily units in the economy. If it's below the line, we have a shortfall. You see, we got to a, a million unit shortfall. Um, that's down to about a 300,000 uh, unit shortfall. There's about 45 million total um, which means in some markets we have shortfalls, in some markets we have excesses, in some markets we have notable excesses. Um, the gap has been narrowed greatly. But the good news for multifamily is the next chart, which is the same chart of the, sh the surplus or shortfall of single family. So we went from a balanced market to having 2.2 million more units than we needed for people four years later. And then you can see the surplus just disappears. And we get to this enormous shortfall of about three and a half percent of the stock of single family housing. That is why home prices have been going up on average faster than inflation since 2011. Um, demand exceeds supply. Um, this is not a gap that's going to disappear in, in a hurry. It's very hard with NIMBYs to get this gap to disappear. This is possibly secular. I'm not saying three and a half percent is secular, but a shortfall is secular. Um, and it's going to mean people have to rent longer uh, to build up the down payment. The down payment is the key. And then let me go through the other property sectors very quickly. And then we'll go to questions. I'm going to do a summary based on vacancy rates. Uh, office, I think the worst is over and the worst is pretty bad. Um, we, if you recall, we had net job growth. And normally when we get net job growth, we get net absorption of office. And essentially over the last four years, we've had job growth and no change in overall aggregate office demand. That's unprecedented. But what we did have in those four years is about four years of pipeline of supply come out. And on a national level, that was on the order of 2% a year. So you had four years of pipeline ending at about 2% a year, I'm rounding. You start at about 9% vacancy or 10% vacancy, and you're suddenly at 17% vacancy. Interestingly, the markets that were growing fastest of prior to four years ago have the biggest problems in some ways. Why? Because they had bigger pipelines. Instead of a 2% pipeline, they had a 3% pipeline. Well, if you had a 3% pipeline and you had four years of pipeline emptying, that's 12% and you have no net new demand. So you went, let's say, from 10% vacancy to 22% vacancy. Markets that had less uh, active pipelines, they also had no growth in demand but the pipeline was emptying at say 1% a year for four years. So you went from 10% to 14. Um, still a sector in trouble. People are slowly realizing they need to go back to work. Um, the most not going back to work should not surprise you is the federal government um, where people are not going back to work. Five, 10, 15% are back at the work. I jokingly say even the president works from home, um, uh, that is kind of a national disgrace that we only have five to 
15% of government workers even coming in, uh, but such it is. Go to the next industrial vacancy, still quite low, uh, particularly NACREF is low, which tends to be uh, better quality uh, warehouse space, but both indexes are low. However, you do see the broader kind of co-star tick up, um, but by and large, still good strength there uh, as space is being absorbed, but certainly not as robust um, as it was a year earlier. Uh, retail, the next chart, vacancy rebound, rebounded back to something like normal. That's because brick sales have rebounded. You've had a lot of tenancy. Yes, the tenants are different than 10 years ago, but they're different than 20 years ago and 30 years ago and 40 years ago. The good centers are nothing more than recycling places to satisfy the consumer wishes of the moment. And so good retail, pretty good shape. Not much being built. There wasn't much pipeline here. It was a little, but there wasn't much pipeline here to go out. And in fact, the pandemic actually destroyed some of the really weak centers and was a net good for the good centers. You go to the next hotel occupancy rates. I mentioned uh, hospitality is basically where it was four years ago. Not quite, but getting close. Um, that's still pent up demand. You can see the rebound, still good distance to go. Next chart, multifamily. Multifamily is low. It's not so much that multifamily is high. There's two measures, NACREF and a broader index. Uh, right now, they're about the same. They've been the same for about a decade, the same as each other. Um, uh, both of them hit bottom, apropos to what we were talking about, about the inflation. Both of them um, got as low as ever about uh, 10 to 12 months ago. That means rents had pushed dramatically until about 10 months ago. And then you see vacancy ticking up and you're seeing prices, excuse me, rents going uh, flatter or going up less rapidly, depending on the market. And so Sunbelt, urban core Sunbelt, notably overbuilt, notable concessions and rent decreases, run of the mill, good suburb, less so. Um, markets that did not have as much supply come online in better shape. Um, so, you know, it, it varies across the country, but the pattern is that. I'm going to just say one last thing, Bruce, before we go to questions. I get asked a lot, how are we going to deal with the government debt? And the last chart is federal government debt. The blue is the headline number. It includes the government owing money to themselves. The not line that says net net, kind of the maroonish line, takes out any debt that the government owes to itself. It, it takes out all intra company debt, which is, if you think about it, if the government paid off its debt that it owed itself, it takes money out of the left pocket, puts it in the right pocket. That's not real, real debt. It registers as debt, but it's not debt, it's intra company debt. And you can see it's high. I'm not trying to say it's not high. Um, it's on the, but that instead of being a number like 115% of GDP, that number is more like 70 to 75% of GDP. Uh, very different. Uh, if you think of GDP as our income, we could pay it off with three quarters of a year of our income. How many of you could pay off the debt on your buildings? with uh, nine months of net operating income, not, not many, right? So in that sense, it's, it's not nearly as big as it appears. And in fact, if you do the last one, which is what do we as a nation owe to foreigners who owe our debt? You can see that actually has declined and is down around 18%. 
of GDP. Now that's something, I'm not trying to say it's nothing. And I constantly say the size of the debt is not nearly as big as it appears. Because remember, if we paid off all the domestically held debt, Bob, an American citizen, would write a check to Joe, an American citizen. And at the end of it, American citizens would have the same amount of money. Who has it is different. Think of it as a flow matter. The interest paid on federal debt goes from taxpayers as a whole to the owners of that debt that are American. That money didn't leave the country. The money written to foreigners does leave the country. That's a net obligation beyond ourselves. So it's not nearly as big as it appears, uh, particularly because government held debt is so large. The real question is, are we getting our money's worth on what the government is spending? And that is an item by item answer. You can't answer that across the board. You may have a gut a reaction across the board, but you would have to evaluate each and every program that the government is spending on to say, are we getting our money's worth? Are we getting our money's worth? And the answer in some of them is going to be absolutely. And the answer for others is going to be, you got to be kidding. Of course not. And so don't worry about the size of it. Worry about, are we getting our money's worth? And Bruce, I'll stop there. Take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. Insightful as always, helpful as always. And certainly eye-opening for me uh, with respect to your, your cut of the inflation numbers. Um, I, I feel like every financial journalist needs to take some short class with you um, so that they can inform us better. Um, nonetheless, I one time mischaracterized you as being an optimist. And you said, no, I'm not an optimist. I'm an empiricist. And I thought that was an important distinction. And it seems from what you're showing today that things are pretty robust, pretty healthy. What concerns you? Well, the th well you know, I, I wrote about this in the most recent Lemon letter. What concerns me in the short term, um, the election, by the way, socially, I, you may worry about the election, but from the, I'm speaking on the economics, the election doesn't have a huge impact on the economy, at least historically. It has a notable impact on winners and losers within the economy. I mean, just think of um, uh, fossil fuel wins and um, uh, renewables lose, just as a very simple example, right? Um, it has a big impact on distribution, less on the economy as a whole. I don't worry about that. Wars, I obviously worry about socially, um, but they don't do much to us as an economy. And you've seen that with the Ukraine and Israel, both horrible situations, and yet it doesn't do much to the economy. So I don't worry about that. Um, I worry about stupid government policy, like really stupid government policy. And I think we have really stupid policy at the Fed. It's not new that I feel that way. And in a democracy, I don't have a right to have a government that only makes smart policy, right? But I laid out why I think it's just absurd. It's simple mathematics. It's, it's not, it, to your point, I'm an empiricist. I'm, I'm not an optimist when I did the inflation. That's just math that I did. Um, uh, what worries me? What worries me are, really fundamental things like um, we have kids going to school who someday are going to be the heart and core of our economy moving forward. And I don't think they're learning nearly as much as they should or once did, or at least many of them once did. I worry about that. I worry about our universities, which once were beacons of of intelligence, losing a grip on that position. That's not to say everybody at a university, but universities in general are a shadow of what they were when I started my career 50 years ago. 
Um, I worry about that because that does affect long term. Um, I, I, I tend to, I worry massively. I'll give you one. Um, it's interesting. I was in a meeting the other day and somebody pointed out something I had never articulated or thought of. I made this point about the federal government doesn't have a big impact overall. Um, the president doesn't have a big impact. And the person said, you know, it's interesting that your local government, your city of Philadelphia, city of New York, city of Chicago, city of San Francisco, they probably have a much bigger impact on the local economy than, than the federal does on the national economy. And so to that point, what worries me is in city after cities, um, we have way too much violence. We have way too much human capital lost uh, in violence. And I'm doing this off the top of my head, Bruce, but I'm kind of right. Uh, the city of Philadelphia, city, not including the suburbs, has basically not grown in the last 12 years. However, the number of opioid deaths um, has grown 12-fold. I mean, really? Just think of the human capital lost forever. And by the way, for everyone that's dying from opioids, there's a whole bunch incapacitated by it. I worry about things like that. I worry about how that affects the uh, desirability of our cities, of our engines of growth. I worry about the human capital. I walk by somebody on the sidewalk and I go, this is a 23 year old. They should be productive. And yet they've incapacitated uh, and may die. Things fundamental like that worry me. I don't get very distracted by a lot of the short term stuff. Thank you. We've had several folks write in about interest rates. What's your take on when the yield curve is going to no longer be inverted? When the Fed wakes up, it shouldn't be inverted. I wrote in December 2022, I think that that point, the rate, short-term rate was um, uh, either four and a half or 4.75, I can't remember which. And I said, absolutely no increases. And if anything, they should be decreasing in January because of this inflation stuff that was obvious was gonna play out uh, as supply caught up. Um, they haven't woken up. They raised the rate at least two times, maybe three times since then. Uh, they've gone flat. It just is absurd how high it is. You figure the long rate has moved up a bit in the last, what, 10 days or so. But the long rate should be down around three and a half, as I said, maybe as high as four. So when do we get a normal yield curve? Whenever the Fed wakes up and moves the short rate down below three and a half or four. I would like to believe, I believe in rationality, and therefore I believe that that should happen in the next six months. It's given the Fed's track record, it's hard to believe they'll get there, but um, it, it easily six cuts uh, should happen of a quarter a point. They, in an ideal world, they cut the rate right now to some number like three and a half. The problem is in the same way they would, they wrong footed the market by saying we are not going to raise interest rates and then did and caused lots of needless disruption. If they cut the rate now to where it should be, they would cause needless disruption. What they should be doing is broadcasting over the rest of this year, it's gonna get down to three and a half or three and a quarter as our target and start moving it in increments so no one gets wrong footed. And then the yield curve would go back to have some slope. Right. Thank you. We had multiple participants inquiring about labor and construction costs and where those are gonna be headed in the next 12 to 24 months. And does 
the impact, uh, does China's slowing economy have any impact on your assessment there? So um, labor costs, as everyone knows, are still going up, but they're going up at a much reduced rate. Um, they're largely going up at the rate of general productivity growth, not necessarily productivity in construction. One of the problems of being in a sector that doesn't have much productivity growth, like construction, is that you have to pay workers the rate that reflects economy-wide productivity growth. Because if you don't, no one will work for you. They'll only go to the sectors that have productivity growth. It's the punishment of being a low productivity growth sector. So I would imagine that you're going to see wages start getting more in the one and a half to 2% annualized increase, which is productivity plus a percent or so uh, as we move through the year. And as you know, materials, some materials are up, some materials are down, kind of flat on materials for the last five months, three, four, five months. Now, kind of consistent with what I was saying about CPI and PCE over the last year. You can find some up, some down. You focus on the ones that are up. You believe you deserve the ones that are down. So I, I think most of the inflation that you'll see in construction will come from the labor side. And as construction diminishes a bit, because uh, office, you're not going to see a lot. You're not going to see much in retail. You're not going to see much in apartments relatively. Um, you'll get a little more aggressiveness out of the trade. So I see pretty decent moderation, maybe even some declines there happening as you go through the year. Um, yeah, Great. let's see how it plays out. Thank you. Well, we'll do one more. Um, we've had several write in about the housing market and what what do you think is going to precipitate a reopening of supply? Well, the supply side is right now you've got two things going on. You've got consumers that want to buy, um, but they're saying, let me wait until the rate comes down a bit, the long rate, which is bumped back up. And most people, some people do, but most people don't need a house in the next 30 days. They can wait a month. They can wait, you know, they can wait it out a little bit. And so you've got demand side kind of in a wait and see and wait for the rate to come down. The worst thing that happens is it doesn't come down and I buy. On the supply side, I think that gap is fundamentally hard to make up. Now, Remember, if we went back to producing 1.1 million housing, single family housing units a year, the gap doesn't disappear, it just stays the same. So if we produce 1.1 million units, the gap remains the same as I showed you, about three and a half percent. And I think it's hard for it to go away because I, I characterize it this way. You can imagine NIMBYs 10 years ago or 12 years ago saying, okay, you can build, we're gonna make life miserable for you, builders, but and expensive for you, but we're gonna let you build a 1.1 million units. And the builder said, no thanks, we're just gonna build 700,000. And that ate away that excess. And then the next year, they said, we're gonna make life miserable for you, but you can build a million one. And they said, no thanks, we're only gonna build 400,000. Well, remember that gap was 2.2 million above the line. So the, for three years or four years, they said, no, we're only going to build 400,000. That ate up the gap. Then you still had a shortfall of capital in the market. And you had a shortfall of capital in the market. And builders took a while to even start building again. And remember, where this line goes flat is if we're building about 1.1 million. I cannot envision a world that after a decade of this shortfall, NIMBY say, 
okay, go build 2 million this year. I just can't envision that. I think that could have happened in the old days before NIMBYism got so entrenched, but I just can't imagine a world where um, NIMBYs would allow 2 million to be built instead of 1.1. And remember, we'd have to do that for three and a half years just to eliminate this. Yep. Maybe they allow a million two instead of a million one and you inch away at it. So I think it's very difficult. I think it's a locked in kind of situation for some time. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to address all the questions that have come in, but I do wanna make everyone aware that this presentation is the digest of what's presented in a lot more detail in the Linneman letter, which is a quarterly subscription from Linneman Associates. And more information on the publication can be found on the Linneman Associates website with the address shown here, linemanassociates.com. And as a final reminder, if you're registered, you will automatically receive an email link to the recording of the webinar uh, later today. Once again, thank you very much, Peter, for helping us make sense of the world. Thank you to everyone for joining today, and we will see you back next quarter. Thank you. Bye-bye.